My name is Jason Broom. Uh, I was in a motor vehicle accident on August 22nd, 2011, and I've been working on recovery since. And I sustained a torn left ventricle, which luckily blood clotted, and they had to put a stint in my left aorta, which was the biggest surgery because your heart can blow out at any time, basically. So I literally hung on by thread. The, the internal bleedings, they had to, to stop those, and the lung surgeries as well because my lungs both completely collapsed and my ribs punctured through the right side. I had a cranial fracture and a lower lumbar spine fracture. I was in my fourth year. I had just recently finished my BA in criminology and sociology at Western. I was still doing a summer class just because I like to do the summer classes. I was in the midst of getting my law school application ready to apply throughout Canada. And if that didn't work out, I was going to apply to England or the USA. My name is Dennis Maneri. I'm 66 years old. I uh, had an infection that got into my blood system and got into my spine, my upper spine. And I had uh, spinal cord surgery and was moved over to Parkwood for my rehabilitation. I have two rods in my back and 12 screws and it starts at the T section of your spine which is just below the, the neck and goes down approximately nine inches. So I uh, was very active, was involved in uh, slow pitch, bowling, curling and golf and Helen and I uh, did a number of trips. We cruised, uh, we were on five or six cruises and we were down both coasts of uh, the country and traveling. And uh, when this uh, occurred, it kind of put a real kibosh on all of that uh, extracurricular activity. So we weren't sure whether I was even going to walk again. My name is Mitchell Brogan. I'm 32 years old and I have a C4 incomplete spinal cord injury. I was riding on my bicycle the night of September 16th, 2006, and I was hit from behind uh, by a drunk driver in a car. I was in a coma for several days. Um, when I came back, I didn't really have my wits about me at all. Um, I didn't know what my situation was. I couldn't speak. Um, I didn't know I couldn't walk. Um, it was only after this sort of one moment uh, when a nurse was brushing my teeth when I sort of came to and asked her why I wasn't brushing my teeth and uh, so she sort of knew that I was sort of there um, and then she asked me if anybody had told me what my situation was I said no as far as I know and uh, and then she sort of put everything down held my hands told me everything that was going on and my situation and we had a, a really good cry together and, and, uh, and then I was pretty much uh, aware of my situation. It makes a big difference when your patients are very motivated and have a lot of drive um, and it's our job to do our, our best to offer them whatever we can do to help them reach their goals. These right here are three of my four external fixator screws that re-piece my pelvis back together and I have a, quite a connection with these knowing that these are inside my body and as you can see that's my blood and they're in my hips and Getting them removed was something I'll never ever forget for my whole life because it was a painful experience beyond any, no comparison to anything else. And you know, I can remember sitting with this thing on and wanting to just tear it off and rip it off. And it was a turning point. Getting these screws out was when I knew it was time to go. It was time for me that I could start recovering again. I could get up and get moving. I basically had no movement in my legs, no movement in my feet for a long time. Uh, there were days that uh, I was down in the dumps. I was quite depressed uh, a couple of times, uh, even to the point where uh, I was crying. And uh, the whole process uh, decided uh, when I thought about that, I thought 
this is another step in life that I don't want to be defeated with and uh, decided that I was going to try and do everything in my power to get back at least on my feet and get back to some kind of normalcy in my life if I could. We had been getting quotes for different machines to get into the, to try to get to our hospital, to get funded for. And one of the vendors told me about a course that was being offered in the States about how to do locomotive training and the clinical aspect of it. So of course I was quite interested in that. I put a proposal together um, and brought it to our management and our medical staff and the other uh, physiotherapists and other mem members of the team that I worked with. And everyone was quite enthusiastic about it and wanted to try to pursue it. And so then we ended up sort of putting the program together. We had a lot of students and research and administration helping us try to put together this program. Um, and Dennis was somebody who was really gonna benefit from the locomotive training program. We always ask our patients what their goals are. And he was still in a power wheelchair at this point and he hadn't really been able to stand or do um, a lot of sort of walking, he wasn't walking yet and he was not standing yet either and in a power chair and I remember him asking him what his goals were and he looked at me right in the eye and said well I want to walk by December 2nd. <laughs> I thought okay um, so and I, and I sort of looked at him right back in the eye and I said okay well then you need to do everything I tell you to do um, and listen to everything I say and work your ass off. I thought well let's give it a try let's see what we can do because they had me at least taking some steps around the floor with this walker, I guess it is. And um, I was still leaning on that. I wasn't really putting weight on my legs. And with the uh, body weight treadmill, uh, they have you in a harness that can lower you down onto your legs, give you more strength each time you're doing it so that your own legs and your own strength that's moving. So you start very slow, to, there's hardly any weight on it, but they get your legs moving and then they lower the, uh, the harnesses and give you more weight. And then they can speed up the treadmill as well. And then it's also done for a length of time. I know he did a fair amount of outpatient therapy afterwards, but he was very excited about, um, he's innovative. And I think that's what our patients need to be and what we all need to be is innovative and figure out the best way that we can get people up on their feet. I discovered the legs uh, in 2007, on my birthday, uh, when an, a good friend of mine, he emailed me uh, a link. It gave me sort of like this, this, this hope for, for the technology. Um, if they have something like this, they must have others. Mitch was very interested in, in the bionics and in the bionic legs. Um, and it's great because that's the only way he's going to get up on his feet. So the Rex bionics legs themselves are $150,000. Uh, they were... Uh, they were provided for um, through the, uh, the insurance company and I'm uh, capable of riding them every day. I'm, uh, I'm able to be in them for about an hour, hour and a half. I know that he had gone to a wedding in those, in those legs because he really wanted to be at the wedding and dance. To be able to boogie on down on the dance floor so um, that ended up happening. And he also told me that he fell but luckily he was not injured. I had very limited progress in physiotherapy from the hospital and from outside of the hospital until I started working with Hans Dyke and me and him took my fitness to the next level. He took a personal interest in me and we did a new program week to week because we wanted to up it just like I was being a hockey athlete again. I was informed about the local motor program through Key Sequera, Dr. Sequera. When our doctors recommended that he look at this program, he didn't want to do it because he thought it was too much work and too intensive. Um, but I think they talked him into doing the assessment. I thought, what, what does this program have to offer me that uh, Hans and me couldn't have already done? He'd been doing a lot of strengthening. He'd been doing a lot of intense therapy the whole way along. And he felt he had gone as far as he could. But the difference, what we could do, is we could train the nervous system in a way that's a little bit different. Just the two tester sessions and I knew immediately like this is that's where I had to be. He's a great example of training the nervous system versus strengthening. He was different on day two in the treadmill than he was on day one. So even getting his nervous system some exposure to walking in a normal pattern without all those compensatory, you know, he would lean over to the side and collapse at his hip and we could control for that um, then his system figured it out because he had all that strength underneath that he'd built up with Hans but his nervous system hadn't figured out how to use it in function and that the treadmill sort of unmasked what what he had what his, he was capable of. It allowed my hips to move back more and my back to release and to kind of get my a core built up through again which I just didn't have 
I mean, a walking core because I had to counterbalance with my weight, with my hips. So it gave me a, a core structure to build through again with the new program. Once he was in the treble environment, felt what it felt like to walk. We were able to get him running right off the off the get go, and for him being a hockey player and an athlete and liking to work hard, that was a really, really great for him. You know, Jansen, the more the better for him. So he was right on board with the intensity, no question. And I got to be thankful for the program. Uh, that's what's got me going. It's got got me on my feet, got my endurance going, and got my attitude changed. And uh, that's the whole name of the game, isn't it? To try to get that active uh, lifestyle back. We have one video, um, and it was with Barry and I walking with him side by side. And it was the reason why it was so exciting. And you can even see Shannon in the background amazed because um, that was right after we got him off the treadmill. And all of a sudden, he was in so much extension, sort of postural extension, and his gait pattern was so good. It was so normal looking. And it was really exciting um, for all of us and for him especially. Within the last five or six months, I've been able to self-transfer um, using a sling and a ceiling track from my chair to, uh, to a bed, which is incredible because I was, I mean, five and a half years with somebody in my space helping me out every night to, uh, to get into bed. And, and it was just after I got back with the, uh, the exoskeleton legs and I said, I was just walking. There's, there's no reason why I can't do this. I've got my pri privacy back at night. I'm looking forward to the next the next step for uh, recovery. Mentally, I'm nowhere near the same person as I was. And that, that hurts to not be the same person, so I have to just take different strategies. Unfortunately, I don't feel I'll ever be able to return to hockey. I wouldn't be able to balance on the skate blades, that precise balance to edge and to cut and turn, uh, just because my, my feet are gone. And that's not a loss that I have to take and move forward with. And I was very depressed about that for a while, but then I started coaching again and reading hockey magazines and following it just the way I used to. People need to see examples like myself and other people uh, that improve, that it's there, that it can be done and the technologies are out there. And then there's professionals like Shannon, Janelle and Barry and those people, they're ready and they're trained to make you a more functional human being again.